wondering who my panellists are, I'll just introduce the five of us and um, hopefully the French will um, join us before we've said anything very interesting or substantive. So um, these, I'm Sarah Richmond and I teach philosophy at UCL and Sartre's philosophy has been one of my research interests for a long time and indeed Sartre has been an interest of mine um, ever since I was a student. So I'm very, very happy to be chairing the panel and I'd like very much to thank all the organisers and when they eventually appear to thank our colleagues in Paris who are, as we speak, engaged in a rival intellectual event called the Nuit Sartre, which is being held at the École Normale Supérieure. And the idea is going to be that eventually they will be put in touch with us and will be able to contribute to this discussion a little bit later. So my four other panellists are as follows, and they'll be speaking in this order. First, Catherine Morris, who teaches philosophy at the University of Oxford. And her research interests include both English-speaking and French philosophy. She's an expert on Wittgenstein, as well as on Sartre and on Nello Ponti, to name just three of the figures that she's interested in. So after Catherine, we're going to hear from Peter Polner, who teaches at the University of Warwick. And among his main research interests are phenomenology and um, the particular um, additional interest is uh, Nietzsche. After Peter, um, Sebastian Gardner will speak, who teaches philosophy. We all teach philosophy, I'm afraid, in English universities. Sebastian teaches at University College London and is interested in quite a broad uh, swathe of European philosophy um, from Kant onwards, um, including the German idealists and, of course, phenomenology, of which Sartre was a part. And then last but not least, Alison Ainley, who teaches at Anglia Ruskin University, and she's got wide interests in um, fairly recent French philosophy from Sartre onwards and in feminism, and she's currently working on a project on Simon de Beauvoir. So these are our four speakers. Well, we still don't have Paris with us, um, but I want to go on just to mention two anniversaries which I'm sure they're as aware of in Paris as we could be here. The first is that 2013, in case anyone hadn't worked it out, is the 70th anniversary of the publication of arguably Sartre's most important work, Being a Nothingness. So that's one anniversary that we're celebrating this year. Another anniversary which they've made something of in Paris, and if you go to the website for the Nuit Sartre, you'll see that they've used the quotation on it. It's slightly spooky. Fifty years ago, presumably, in 1963, Sartre speculated in his very famous autobiography, Les Mots, about how people might see him 50 years later. And he actually wrote... How will I be interpreted in 2013 when the two keys unable to unlock me will have become available? My death and my work. So, as I say, slightly spooky feeling that we are actually helping to answer a question which Sartre himself raised um, exactly 50 years ago in Les Mots. Ah! Oh, Hello, France. <laughs> uh, no, we, we haven't quite got them yet. Okay. Um, so, although I've just mentioned Limo, I suspect that here in London we're going to be talking more about the philosophical text being a nothingness, because that's going to be the text that most of us work with most of the time. And I wanted to just kick off by talking about this general question that we've been asked to answer which is, what does Sartre represent in British eyes? And as English people invariably do, I want to narrow the question down and talk about it instead within the narrower focus of how is Sartre understood today in Anglophone philosophy departments? And it seems to me that there are two ways in which he's often approached. So on the one hand, 
he's regarded increasingly as a historical figure. Somebody who wrote during the Second World War and not long afterwards, who belongs to a movement or school within European philosophy known as phenomenology, which starts with Husserl, goes through Heidegger, and ends up, after it's taken an existentialist turn, being developed by Sartre and Merleau-Ponty. So he's just a member of a tradition which is now more or less over. Now, when he's looked at in this historical way, an advantage of this is that, of course, the full scale of his ambition can be recognised. And he's thought of somebody who, like Heidegger, was trying to offer a very wide-ranging account of human existence in the world, as well as an important recommendation about the framework in which this account should be given. In other words, within the parameters of ontology, which is a study of the kinds of being that there are. So we get all that, as you'd expect, by thinking of him as a historical figure. But for many people, that's disappointing. The thought is we don't quite want to start classify Sartre as a figure from the past. It would be nice if there was something in his thought that's still definitely of contemporary relevance and that we can be excited by today. And maybe we especially think that about his thought because after all, it's existentialism and it's supposed to be an account of everyday life in the world. And there might be something appealing about thinking that we can still get something from Sartre's philosophy about our existence in the world. But what would the key insight be? So that's going to be something that I think some of the speakers might have something to say about. And perhaps when the people in France join us, they'll be able to say something about that too. But just before handing over, I want to consider one way in which Sartre is sometimes um, dragged into contemporary debate and said to have um, contemporary relevance. It's a way in which philosophers in the analytic tradition have tried to accord some respect to Sartre and to bring him into dialogue, mainly with philosophers of mind. And that is qua phenomenologist. So the idea is that Sartre, definitely along with Merleau-Ponty, and often Heidegger is included too, has this sort of brilliant method. He shows us something which is phenomenology, and if we use this method, we will be able to gain great insights. And I'll give you two examples of the insights that are ascribed to these phenomenologists. So the first is the existence of the pre-reflective cogito, or pre-reflective self-consciousness. And I just wanted to quickly quote from Dan Zahavi and Sean Gallagher, two philosophers who are definitely addressing primarily an analytic audience, who say, on the phenomenological view, a minimal form of self-consciousness is a constant structural feature of conscious experience. And Sartre is one of the phenomenologists who is acknowledged as having seen this immediate and first personal givenness of experiential phenomena must be accounted for in terms of pre-reflective self-consciousness. So that's my first example of something that we're said to owe to Sartre and which is alive today. The second example also, which comes from the idea that Sartre offers us phenomenological insights of great value, is his acknowledgement of the body. Now this is a very complicated question, the whole issue of Sartre's um, treatment of the body, but nonetheless he is, along with Merleau-Ponty, quite often given recognition as somebody who properly saw that we should understand ourselves as agents situated within the world, among worldly objects, whose primary consciousness of ourselves is as embodied beings. And this uh, insight has been especially put to use within the medical humanities, for example, um, in this country by Javi Carell and in the United States by Kay Toombs, who both think that a Sartrean account of the body is very useful for an account of the normal lived body, 
And against the background of that account, we can come to understand the nature of the illness experience. So those are the two examples I wanted to give you. And just before handing over, I wanted to express some doubt about whether this is really doing Sartre such a great favour. I think there are at least three ways in this, um, three ways in which this appropriation of Sartre is disappointing and possibly distorting. So the way in which it's disappointing is that it makes it seem as though he just says some fairly obvious and banal things. It's not very difficult to be a phenomenologist on this account. All you need to do is think about what it's like to be a person and give a reasonably good description of it. And it doesn't seem that it's so much of an achievement. So I think that's one reason for finding it at least a limited way of according respect to Sartre's thought. But there's a, another stronger reason for resisting it, which is that, of course, by extracting his so-called phenomenological insights from the ontological background in which he embedded them, the whole project is wildly distorted. So I now can see the French, two French people, but I was told they'd be on our screen. Can you hear me in France? Hello. Oh, hello. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you when I'd like you to say something. Is <laughs> <laughs> that right? Uh, we were just surprised because uh, with the um, uh, starting time, it's supposed to be 9.30 for you and 10.30 for us. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we've started, but you haven't missed too much. So, because there are time constraints here, if you just start listening now, and then there should still be plenty of time for you to say what you think. Is that okay? Um, I understood everything, but uh, we'll do as you, as you think. Okay, okay. So, so we'll, we'll go on talking, talking and I'll hand, hand over, over to you. you. Okay. Good. Okay, so the second reason, um, which I won't spend longer on, is that it... Um, overlooks the fact that Sartre's phenomenology is supposed to be in the service of an ontology, and therefore his phenomenological findings are, I think, theory-laden. They're not from a neutral perspective. And I think understanding that helps us understand why some of the common criticisms, for example, of his account of love, are um, based on a kind of misunderstanding about how Sartre was um, understanding his project. And the third thing which this... Do you mind if I interrupt you for one second? No, no, not at all. Um, would you be so kind as to just take one second to, to um, just tell us, uh, uh, introduce yourself or our topic which is uh, getting in? And we will try and tell you what's happening in the Nuit Sartre in Paris, just interrupting you for one second. I'm sorry about that, but... Uh, it's going to be better for both public Absolutely. So, so do you want me to introduce everyone here? Please. Okay. okay. Please, I'm Sarah Richmond. This is Sebastian Gardner to my left, who teaches at UCL. Catherine Morris here, who teaches at Oxford. Peter Polner, who teaches at Warwick. And Alison Ainley who teaches at Anglia Ruskin University, and all of us have got interests in Sartre as a philosopher. Thank you very much, Tara. In uh, Paris here, we are in the middle of the Nuit Sartre, and uh, we will be two, of the two to, to um, not really uh, respond to you, but just answer and uh, have our public introduced to you. So I tell my colleague, these are the British philosophers and uh, English-speaking philosophers in London. Speaking about that, and we will be two. Tom Flynn here is American. His teachers at uh, Emory in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and then Frederic Vance in Paris. And sorry for interrupting you. There was a mistake in the time. We're here supposed to start at 10:30. So 
Um, sorry again, and we, we will listen to your, your presentations. And when you want us to comment, you just tell us that uh, our public is arriving right now. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. So just Thank in you. case anyone wanted to get Your life was to allow for it to go well. Sorry? Your life was to allow for it to go well, I'm sure. Yes, it is. Okay, sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. So, so just, just in case, case um, not everyone got that. that. Oh, Our two, I'm not going to do about it. Our two uh, interlocutors in Paris who've just been introduced are Frederick Vons and Thomas Flynn, and they're hoping to participate as we go. Um, so, I'll very quickly say my third objection to this idea that the value of Sartre lies in his phenomenology, understood in the way in which these philosophers of mind understand it. And the third objection is that it takes no account of the importance that Sartre attached to the type of reflection within which so-called phenomenological findings are retrieved. And I'm talking here, of course, of his very important distinction between um, bad faith and good faith. And this applies even in the case of love, because he actually explicitly says in Being and Nothingness that he isn't ruling out the possibility of an authentic kind of love, but he isn't going to be able to describe it in Being and Nothingness. So what I've done now is say something quite negative about one alternative way of understanding Sartre, one way which avoids simply classifying him as a bygone historical figure. But I'll stop now and ask Catherine Morris to um, make any comments that she'd like to make about Sartre. So um, thank you very, very much for the invitation to this event. I didn't go last year and I had no idea what to expect and it's really amazing to see so many people here. Um, the way I kind of thought about what I might try to address in, in what I was going to say today. Um, I, I suppose I thought of myself as addressing the question of what relevance are Sartre's ideas to various topics in contemporary philosophy of mind as this is treated by so-called... Can you hear back there? Uh, as this, as this is treated by various um, uh, uh, so-called analytic philosophers. Um, but I, I think as soon as I posed the question in that particular way to myself, I started to see problems. First, that Sartre actually avoids the term mind altogether. Uh, arguably because of its historically sedimented opposition to the term body, which picks up on uh, an important point that Sarah was making. But secondly, because there's something about the idea of topics in philosophy of mind, which suggests a kind of atomistic approach, as if one could address any one of these topics without addressing the others as if one could be a specialist in, say, consciousness without having thought at all about, say, freedom or the emotions or self-deception or action. And indeed, as if one could address philosophy of mind without addressing larger issues of epistemology, ontology, and even ethics. So I began to wonder whether that way of posing the question was the right way of posing it. But in a way, it's these kind of arrière-pensée on my initial formulation of the question that suggests to me Sartre's real relevance. Um, I, I think it's important not to make vast generalizations, and yet I'm probably going to find myself doing that a bit here. Um, I don't want to offend um, those noble exceptions to these generalizations. But it does seem to me that whatever the explanation I'm sure there are cultural explanations, um, amongst other things. But whatever the explanation is, much analytic philosophy of mind does suffer in the first place from over-specialization. And in the second place, and even more importantly from the point of view of what I'm going to be talking about, 
it suffers from what I'm going to call scientism. Um, and that, I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment, but that a consideration of Sartre's, quote, philosophy of mind, what might be better called a philosophy of human reality, can act as an invaluable corrective to, to these. So, um, I just want to say a little bit more about what I mean by the scientism in the, in the sense in which I think what I'm calling scientism is endemic in much analytic philosophy of mind. The term scientism is used in various ways. For example, it can mean the conviction, I mean, I personally might say prejudice, uh, according to which science's methods of inquiry are the only valid ways of knowing. But what I have in mind is much more a kind of ontological scientism, which supposes, and here I'm using Merleau-Ponty's phrase, um, an ontological scientism which supposes that the real world is the physical world as science conceives it. I think, and I'm going to try and illustrate this, that this shows up in much analytic philosophy of mind in at least three linked ways. The first of these ways is there's a kind of domin dominant assumption in much uh, analytic philosophy, uh, according to which the only, if we're, if we're talking about one fundamental problem in philosophy of mind, which is the mind-body problem, so-called, that the only ontological alternatives are physicalism and dualism. And together with that goes a, a presupposition that dualism is just a non-starter. Um, it's a, a, a weak cloak or something like that. that um, uh, it, 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 um, so I, either what there is, it, um, when we're talking about human beings, either what there is is what the physical sciences say there is, or we've got to posit a non-physical soul or mind a la Descartes. And at the very least, I want to say with Wittgenstein, and I think that Sartre would agree with this, um, I'm not that hard up for categories. Uh, in other words, there have got to be other possibilities than either physicalism or dualism. So that's one dominant assumption. And I think the other two assumptions more or less follow from it. A second assumption is that all real relations are external and paradigmatically causal, where causal is understood as something like efficient cause, other Aristotle. Um, and just to explain a little bit more what I mean by that, by an external relation, I mean that if you've got, quote, two things, Either they're identical or they're not. And if they're not identical, then they are what they are, independently of each other. And of course, I, I mean, as a footnote or, or a parenthesis, analytic philosophers will acknowledge that descriptions of things can be internally related. And people who are familiar with Donald Davidson will acknowledge, uh, will, will say, for example, that even you know, the cause and effect can be construed as internally related if we describe B as the cause of A, and then we can say the cause of A caused A. And there's a logical relation between, apparently a logical relation between A and B. But they'll go on to say that things themselves can't be internally related. And this is an assumption that the phenomenologists are challenging all the time, including Sartre, of course. Um, and and I'll, again, I'll say much more about this in a moment, but um, that there are many real internal relations, um, that, that things um, can be internally related. Um, so I'm just identifying some of the assumptions that it seems to me constitute scientism in, philosophy, in analytic philosophy of mind. 
A third assumption is something like this, that only the positive is real. That is to say that there's no room in reality for absences and lacks. That there's no room in reality for motivationally non-neutral qualities of objects. And that there's no sense to be made of the notion of what Aristotle called the final cause. That is, there's no room for the idea that explaining actions might require a reference to something that, that does not yet exist. Um, so, um, I'm just going to sketch out very briefly, um, I have no idea how long I've been talking now, but let me just say, say very briefly something that Sartre says about action. Um, anybody who's studied philosophy of mind will probably have studied philosophy of action, and you'll have been told that Actions are intentional, Sartre says so too, as distinct, for example, from accidents, just tripping over something or whatever it might be. But you'll probably also have been told that um, actions are typically, you know, to, to call an action intentional is to say that it's done for a reason. And you'll have been told that there's a lot of controversy about it, but basically most and Luke philosophers of mind agree that reasons are causes. Now, Sartre, of course, agrees with that too, but everything depends on what you mean by cause. For Sartre, the cause of an action makes essential reference to some things that I referred to earlier. The cause of an action makes essential reference to, on the one hand, um, non-existence, things that don't exist. And I'll, I'll give an example in a moment. And it makes essential reference, on the other hand, to internal relations. So that if I decide that um, what I really feel right now is the cocktail called a Negroni, and I go to my cupboard and, oh my God, there's no Campari. Right. Um, so what I've encountered in the world is what Sartre calls an absence. It's a lack of Campari in my cupboard. And it's that lack which motivates my immediately running to the shop and going and getting some Campari, right? So my action requires essential reference to an absence, namely the absence of Campari. Now, that, that absence in the world only appears in the world in virtue of my desire for a Negroni, which requires um, Campari to make it, um, and various other ingredients, which you don't need to know at this stage. But, um, but in order to, but um, that desire, so, so here's the state of the world, which is an absence, which most Anglo-American philosophers already can't talk about. But that absence in the world is internally related to my, my desire for a Negroni. Um, in, in this precise sense, that that absence in the world would not exist were it not for my desire. Um, right, because otherwise, there's all kinds of things that aren't on my um, cocktail shelf. I mean, there isn't any pastis, but at the moment, it doesn't make any difference to me. But pastis, so pastis isn't absent, but, but Campari is. So, so there's an internal relation between my desire for, the, for this particular cocktail, cocktail and this stage of the world, namely the absence of, of Campari. Moreover, my desire for a Negroni makes essential reference to a non-existent state of affairs in the future. It, it's in the future, so it doesn't yet exist, right? Namely, that state of affairs where I've actually got all the ingredients for the Negroni, and I can sit down and make my cocktail and, and drink it. Could it be a more simple, boring, straightforward example? But what that shows, it seems to me, is that an explanation of action we can, call all, we can call the absence of, of Campari 
a cause of my going to the shops. That's not a problem. But the important thing is that, A, it's a cause that, doesn't, that, that, that is a non-existent. B, it's a cause that's internally, internally and not externally related to my desire. And C, that desire itself is essentially related to another non-existent, namely that non-existent future state of affairs where I have the ingredients for a Negroni. None of that is anything that um, Anglo-American philosophers of action can say. Um, and it seems to me that you can't properly characterize action unless you give up those three assumptions of scientism that I identified, that I identified earlier. One, again, that either you've got to be a physicalist or you've got to be a dualist. Two, that all relations are external. And three, that only the positive is real. And there I'm going to stop. Thank you very much, Catherine. OK, um, how to talk about Sartre today. Um, I suppose, for me, um, Sartre is really a sort of singular figure in, in 20th century philosophy. Um, and what makes him singular are really many things, but perhaps more than anything else, his ability, I think, to combine really quite technical um, academic inquiries associated in Anglo-American discourse with you know, philosophy of mind, um, and on the other hand, questions that are really of profound concern to anyone, um, questions about substantive meaning and significance, about uh, what it is to lead a human life, um, and how one ought to live such a life. Um, and I think it's this, um, I mean, Catherine earlier referred to him as a, as a kind of Sarah, a kind of holistic philosopher. Um, he doesn't, he, he's certainly, he has something to say about specific philosophical and often quite technical issues, um, but he's interested in these technical issues within the sort of purview of a much larger project of understanding human reality in a holistic manner. And I think this, this kind of approach of of his is, is really something that makes him, uh, and, and, and his sheer ability to carry it out and his, 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 his skill at it is something that makes him really quite um, um, quite unique and I think quite, uh, very, very relevant uh, today. Um, somebody once said, I think it was Schopenhauer once said about uh, Kant, but um, um, even in his mistakes he's more interesting than uh, other people are in their correctitudes. I think something similar might be said about, about Sartre. Um, so perhaps, I mean, I, I want to talk briefly in a minute about two issues that, um, two aspects of Sartre's work that especially interest me, um, um, out of this huge panoply of, of things one could pick. Um, but perhaps just as a way into this, um, um, I want to ask why it is that Sartre has had such a peculiar reception um, um, and why his, um, I suppose, his reputation has undergone such dramatic shifts. Um, so perhaps one thing one can say within an Anglophone context is that um, um, he wasn't, for a long time, I think he just wasn't taken very seriously at all. Um, and that had to do with the fact that he was a phenomenologist. Uh, he was interested in the, the fundamental structures of our um, everyday engagement with the world, um, and I, how the world appears to us and how we appear to ourselves in this everyday engagement. Um, so he's interested in a, in a sort of human personal level self-understanding, um, and not primarily, um, perhaps this is something I might disagree with, uh, um, with Sarah on, um, not primarily perhaps interested in certainly metaphysics, even though of course he distinguishes ontology from metaphysics, um, so he's not, he's not really primarily interested in classical Sartre, except for the early period Sartre. He's not interested in um, questions about ultimate and possibly evidence transcendent um, constitution of things. Um, and one of the meanings, I think, of his slogan that we're condemned to be free is just this, that it's irrational to demand that we ought to think about ourselves at the fundamental level uh, in ways that just bypass these constitutive structures of everyday conscious self-understanding as we're engaged in the world, our first personal understanding of ourselves. Um, for what is to count as significant or important, yeah, and hence normativity itself, 
cannot be made sense of in abstraction from, from these. Um, so the first task of philosophy consists in elucidation and explication of these, of these structures of everyday self-understanding. And I think it's that approach, that fundamental approach that he shares with other philologists that simply um, made him, I think certainly made him a marginal figure within um, the Anglophone discourse because the sort of issues that he uh, and the philologists were primarily interested in were not issues that took center stage um, in, in, for, for, for many decades and um, in, in the mainstream of analytic philosophy. And perhaps another aspect connected with this, for this relative marginalization of his, was that um, phenomenology itself was simply not very well known um, for, uh, you know, until the 1980s. So Sartre very often alludes to um, kind of technical, quite technical concepts of uh, phenomenology, um, transcendence versus immanence, noesis, noema, the thetic versus the non-thetic, etc. Um, and um, um, I, th I think very often, the, I mean, if one reads these early discussions of Sartre in, in um, English-speaking context, um, one finds that quite often these, these technical concepts weren't really properly understood. Uh, so what was around really was a kind of distorted version of what phenomenology is. It's a kind of describing things, you know, what could be easier than that, just describing things, um, and um, doing so in some kind of introspectionist, Cartesian, um, internalist manner. Um, and that was the kind of caricature of phenomenology into which Sartre was fitted. And of course it's not true, of that caricature certainly, I mean, nothing could be further from what Sartre is really about, uh, and it, we might say his predecessors as well. Um, second reason, perhaps, then, why I think there was this underappreciation in academic philosophy is, is, of course, Sartre's extraordinary rhetorical flair, and um, his penchant very often for hyperbole and apparent paradox. And I think this is again connected to his desire to reach out beyond the confines of a sort of meticulous technical inquiry um, to a wider educated public, and his desire to impress that public um, with the novelty of his ideas. So there are some famous examples of this uh, rhetorical hyperbole <clears throat> in his writing, uh, which then were often, of course, gleefully held against him. Um, so, you know, he says famously in Being and Nothingness, it is I who sustain values in being, um, as a being by whom values exist, I am unjustifiable. And if one then reads what he says elsewhere, one finds that such statements need to be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, yes, all reasons ultimately, he holds, all reasons ultimately depend on values, and uh, values depend on consciousness, but not on any one particular consciousness, mine or yours. Um, and the claim that my, choice, my choices are unjustified, uh, on a more careful reading, it comes to the much less bizarre, but still striking idea that no object with a particular universal or propositional can rationally constitute the ultimate justificatory ground of our commitments. Uh, for that ground is lived consciousness itself, um, and consciousness as lived is in principle not an object. Um, so there's been a huge amount, I think, then, of partly uh, of, of misunderstanding of Sartre, Sartre partly um, due to his own. Um, bit, uh, by, by his own fault, um, and partly by that, um, it, uh, by ignorance of others, really. But there's perhaps a deeper reason why, aside from such, we might say, superficial misunderstandings, uh, why Sartre really fell out of favor during, um, let's say, the 1960s, even in those contexts, say, in France or in Germany, uh, where he had been influential up until then. Um, and I think this had to do with, so, so for, for a long time, I think Sartre wasn't really taken seriously, even in those contexts where he had been uh, for decades before. Um, and this, I think, had to do with really the individualist flavor of, um, um, or the individualist focus of his existentialism, um, crystallized in his claim that consciousness is autonomous in never being determined by its facticity. Um, and, of course, the, 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 there's been a standard criticism um, of this, um, first, to my knowledge, voiced by Melaponte in 1945, um, and then taken up um, by many others afterwards, um, against this picture of the freedom of consciousness. Melaponte had 
um, said in uh, the phonology of perception, uh, I am a psychological and historical structure, and I have received a manner of existence, a style. Um, so the very meanings that are available to me to surpass my facticity, um, the givenness in which I find myself, these meanings um, uh, towards which or with, with, with which I can project myself into the future are necessarily shaped by that facticity. They include public given um, linguistic and conceptual structures um, that make possible individual agency. And these structures can't be either wholly created or fully surpassed by anyone, by anyone for itself. Now, I think this, this criticism picks up on a very important point, or is a very, you know, it makes a very important point. But I do wonder whether Sartre really needed to or wanted to deny it. So, if, for example, we look at his biography of Genet, written in 1952, um, he says quite explicitly there that um, Genet, uh, having been labeled a thief by the milieu in which he grew up, defiantly adopted this label as marking his essence. Uh, he wanted to be, to have the essence of a thief. Um, and Sartre then adds, adds to this description, or this explication, um, he says, quote, Genet's original crisis can be understood only within a village framework, yet in a purely agricultural society, he would have been irremediably lost. His conversion isn't even conceivable if one does not imagine an incipient disintegration in the small village community which brought him up and then banished him. Now, this, is, I think, is a striking acknowledgement of Merleau-Ponty's criticism. And yet, Sartre doesn't see it as affecting the core of his theory of freedom of consciousness. Uh, and he goes on to say, the fact remains that every decision emanates from a pure and unqualified freedom which aims at giving itself a being, though without ever quite succeeding. And this is, of course, in all essentials, the position that he'd already held uh, at the time of writing Being and Nothing. Should I stop here? Okay. So, um, so my brief was I'm going to talk about uh, Sartre's ethics and um, to establish some continuity of what Peter's just been talking about, the uh, negative reception that Sartre received. Um, this is particularly pronounced, I think, in the case of Sartre's ethical theory. Uh, and if one looks back at the things that were written about Sartre's so, moral thing. Is that your seat one closer to the microphone? If, if one if one looks back at the things that were written about Sartre as an ethical thinker in the 1960s and 70s, one uh, sees that the uh, consistent characterization of Sartre was as some kind of radical subjectivist or perhaps even moral nihilist. So things commonly said, uh, Sartre uh, denies the existence of any objective uh, moral truths or moral norms. Sartre holds that all values are invented, that we're free to invent whatever values we want. Sartre is compared with uh, Nietzsche uh, and so on. Well, it, 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 that, that is the picture that um, held sway. And um, the striking thing about it in a way is that it's just clearly wrong uh, for a number of very, very basic reasons. Uh, so let me just trot them out. I mean, firstly, there is clearly no sense in which Sartre can be a subjectivist of our familiar Humean, or even Nietzschean kind, because he doesn't think that there is a, a basic psychology of sentiments or affects or drives on which to rest uh, values. Secondly, Sartre clearly thinks that it's part of the, uh, the anguish, the agony of uh, the practical situation that one cannot refer inwards to any facts about one's character or constitution or psychology in order to work out what to do. Uh, we see this in his presentation of the young man in the uh, existentialism and humanism lecture, and then again, great length in the, the, the novels, The Rose to Freedom. So ca Sartre's characters are uh, uh, looking for uh, a normative orientation that transcends their own psychology. Now, the, the, the consensus is, or it's tended to be, that Sartre fails to provide it. Um, I, I think, and here I'm perhaps indicating my interest, the nature of my interest in Sartre, which is to see him in a broadly Kantian tradition that 
pins together a three-sentence metaphysics, uh, or ontology if you prefer, uh, freedom and ethics. And looked at in that light, it seems to me that um, uh, Sartre has a, a very, very interesting, well, it's not entirely unproblematic, but it's not a, clearly a disaster either, um, argument in, uh, or on the basis of being nothingness um, for uh, something that is recognisably an interesting ethical position. Um, well, I mean, there's a great deal to be said about the, the, the nature of the argument given for the affirmation of freedom as an absolute end or absolute value, and then about what it means to affirm freedom as an absolute end or an absolute value. It, it, perhaps the only point, last point I'll make is just about, um, just this question, Peter's already touched on, why was it that Sartre's philosophical interest slipped out of focus or was never brought into focus or not for a very, very long time? Um, in the case of the ethical theory, there are these various circumstantial things that he never, that the ethical sequel to being nothing that's never appeared, the uh, writings that we now have as the notebooks for an ethics and the war diary, all of that appeared uh, a good bit later. Um, th there was also the consideration that at least British uh, Anglo-American philosophers at the time looking at Sartre had in mind various meta-ethical meta positions, emotivism, prescriptivism, uh, to which they tended to assimilate Sartre, I think. Uh, thirdly, I think there was also a conflation of Sartre with Heidegger, uh, even though their ethical positions are really quite distinct. But uh, perhaps the most important factor is uh, Sartre's own view that, and one sees this explored um, at great length in the Notebooks for an Ethics, that the, the translation of the absolute value or absolute end of freedom into determinate, concrete moral practice is an intensely difficult matter. Um, Sartre thinks that Kant, uh, as many people think, Kant was greatly mistaken in supposing one could go directly from this famous formula of the categorical imperative to determinate concrete maxims. Um, and Sartre believes that a, 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 a great deal of additional apparatus is involved in doing that. The, the crucial thing being, I think, for Sartre, um, the apprehension of the other's freedom. And Sartre thinks that that is something systematically elusive and difficult to complete. And he thinks that that is, uh, in a sense, the precondition for ethics. One has to grasp the other's freedom fully to realize it in some manner before ethics can uh, really begin. So the, the absence from Sartre of a system of duties and obligations or any uh, detailed set of prescriptions, I think, uh, played a large role in, uh, or contributed uh, to a large degree in uh, giving rise to this impression that Sartre had no ethical theory worth, uh, worth the name. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to talk about Sartre's relationship with de Beauvoir, Simone de Beauvoir, um, not merely in a biographical sense. I want to link some of the things that Peter said about the um, notion of existentialism as a, a lived philosophy or addressing questions of how one might live. Um, as you probably know, Sartre and de Beauvoir were lifelong companions, but they were also philosophers in their own right. And they believed that it was important for philosophers to live out their ideas. And um, they attempted, at least, to uh, embody in their own relationship some of those questions about equality, and authenticity and personal freedom that Sartre writes about. So it seems consistent with um, Sartre's philosophy um, when he's talking about authenticity and freedom that those ideas would be um, continuous with the way that he lived. Um, and I think what's interesting, as I say, um, there's a whole publishing industry um, generated around their relationship, about who might be to blame or who might not be to blame, um, what they wrote about each other, what other people have written about them. Um, but I want to move on to talk about the philosophical implications of these questions, because I think they do raise questions about, um, about gender, about interpersonal relations, and about the body in a way that links with some of the things that Peter was saying. Um, Simone de Beauvoir published um, a book called The Second Sex in 1949, and um, it's clear that she draws a lot of inspiration from Sartre's existentialism, and um, it's known as a, a Bible of feminism. 
Um, but that's partly because she takes on the notion of freedom, of choice, of um, self-determination, and of um, the idea that um, striving for one's projects is um, a crucial aspect to uh, authenticity. So, in effect, that um, feminist slogan, the personal is political, and the question of the context in which one can live is um, addressed in that book. Um, and I think what she does in the book um, is, to, is to take many of Selcher's claims and extend them creatively as well. I mean, she, sometimes people think it's just a criticism of Sartre's existentialism, but I think what she, what she attempts to do is to look at interpersonal relations um, through existentialism, through what Sartre said, to develop them. Um, and I know that um, we've already talked about how Sartre's phenomenological descriptions are not merely descriptions, they're theory laden. But I think she insistently makes the point that those descriptions link back to real lives, to real bodies and the way that um, one might exist in the world. And I think sometimes Sartre's descriptions do slip into sadomasochistic um, descriptions of dominance or being dominated. If you can maintain a reciprocity with another, it can be quite fragile and um, possibly wary or suspicious. And um, I think Sartre sometimes also slips into unease about the physical body. Um, not always the case, but sometimes he suggests there's a kind of horror associated with being or not being a thing, avoiding being trapped as, and being seen as matter. Because, of course, freedom is about possibilities and um, sometimes the body can seem like a leaden restriction to all those scintillating possibilities not yet realised. So I think um, de Beauvoir does ask some critical questions about Sartre and how, if indeed what he says is to link with our lived experience, we might understand that if we're not all embodied in the same way, if different people have different bodies, if different bodies have different cultural um, values, different kinds of symbolism. And her question is really what happens perhaps if women have been symbolised as passive or as uh, bodies, um, as objects and in effect as the other. Um, so she's asking questions about the real context all these sorts of um, questions about freedom. So how does ontological freedom play out if you've got real economic inequality or if there are limitations on your projects and potentials? So um, the last thing that I want to say is really um, about de Beauvoir's um, address to that question. And I think um, she does um, try to develop that notion of embodiment in a very specific way. Um, and she asks us um, what it's like if you are the other. How are you um, to understand your particular um, choices and your freedom? And um, so I think um, Sartre's contribution to this is to point out the, um, how much um, purchase these um, p particular questions might have on lived experience, that this freedom um, can be understood in context, and we only see that in his later political work, um, I think developing more out of that. Um, so I'd better stop there, I think. Thanks. Uh, so, how's this going down in Paris? Well, we had some transmission problems, but uh, maybe you can start the discussion unless Tom... I guess, and there was a bit of an echo in your room that we had. It makes it a little harder for us to get these words as carriers. Uh, you know, we had to kind of, it's almost a bit more listening to a foreign language, but that is true. Uh, so, there is a lot of discussion, and if we, if we can join, we, we will. Do you want our reactions about the idea that the state would be I've just been uh, informed that we have five minutes. So, um, Maybe right. if there's anything you'd like to say by way of response, or, or just your own thoughts about the Louis Sartre and Sartre through French eyes. Sure. Let me throw in one. One uh, being uh, American, of course, I'll get this rather uh, cavalier. I suppose point to things, but uh, George Kidd, a uh, political scientist at Princeton, once asked me after a lecture I had given, "Why is it that Sartre is the person everyone loves to hate?" 
Now, I gave him a rather, I think, simplistic maybe answer in terms of what you would say, but it hasn't been mentioned yet. And that was what we could call his hyperbolic politics. That seems to be something that people are touched immediately with and think this fellow needs to be taken seriously because he's an anarchist, he's a, uh, uh, he hangs out with people who are, are uh, into violence, uh, apparently just not for the fun of it, he, he never said that, he denied that. But I mean, uh, things that people would consider uh, not worth taking seriously, even by not uh, opposing it. So uh, people have to make distinctions, I think. And even Socrates himself, we could see in terms of his life, these things develop. I mean, uh, the notion of authenticity could easily have has been done by someone like Charles Taylor, fit, fit it into a, a, a virtue ethics, for example, that is it's not at all for uh, the notion of moral creativity. is not at all for It's very dangerous, of course. Because how could they want to be morally created without being immoral? And that, of course, is something he's much, very much aware of. But I think those are some of the, some of the issues that I think uh, we'd have to, uh, you know, uh, under other day. With Beauvoir, uh, he encouraged her actually to publish Second Sex just to, to do this research. So it wasn't as if he was opposed or even, you know, uh, indifferent. I don't think that was true at all. Um, as far as relationships go, he, it's true, the notion of relations are very important to him. He said in the Schultz interviews that what distinguished him from the communists was he was a metaphysician, and they were not. Now, whether you want to take that seriously, let's face it, some of his interviews, he's just telling people what he thinks they want him, uh, want him to say. And so we have to, I would say, take what we have saw, but I think you're going to have to put these interviews on top of each other like a slide projector with the various uh, 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 various slides on it, uh, overhead projector, and see if any meaningful whole emerges. You hope it will, that there's some overlap, some contradiction maybe. But, uh, and I guess the last thing I would say would be that he's very clear, <clears throat> he says in so many words, in search for a method, that there are only individuals and real relations uh, uh, between them or even among them. And uh, of course, uh, for someone who was a dialectical nominalist, that's quite a plain thing. But uh, he thought that was true. So obviously he's aware of real relationships. Now, whether they're internal, uh, uh, certainly wouldn't all be internal. He'd end up with, with, with gravity or something like that. But uh, there are certainly, for him, uh, relationships that are constitutive, uh, that are, you could call them essential if you want. Uh, and, uh, and those would, I see, I think, be a, a sign that the fellow is really as, as off the wall as some people might like. And maybe you other people obviously are not part of that group, uh, very supportive of it. But the um, last thing I would say would be about the notion of merleau ponties critique. Sartre actually took his uh, merleau ponties The Adventures of the Dialectic, very seriously. It's as if he had that thing sitting on the table when he wrote the Critique of the Dialectical Reason. Very clear. Merrill Ponte said he doesn't have a sense of objective possibility. Sartre wants to say, or of the uh, 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 interwar uh, at the moment. Uh, Sartre uses that term and then wants to say, I do have that. Uh, and objective possibility in, in, in notebooks for medics, which Merrill should have read because some of his criticisms are already answered in, uh, in sorry, uh, the uh, Communists of Peace. He should have read that uh, because uh, Sartre will say a great line, I think. History opens the doors for some people and leaves other people to pull their heels before closed doors. Now that is not, you can do anything you want. You can, you can ignore no objective possibility. Of course there is objective possibility. And you have someone like Heinrich in the play uh, The Devil and the Good Lord. And he's in a situation where you're damned if you're viewer and you're damned if you don't. That is, he is in a, uh, an impasse. And so I want to say, well, we've got to somehow bring it about that this wouldn't be the case. And so uh, I, I realize I'm just speaking somewhat particularly, but I hope that as you were, uh, I'm going to hand it uh, had that to you now. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tom. Maybe I had one question too. I had one, one of the debates was between this philosophy of mind and metaphysics or ordinary life uh, description. 
And in this point, there is no contradiction, I would say. It's, it's exactly the, the same. I mean, there is no other world. I mean, the, 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 our mind is a relationship to the actual world. As a, this is where um, actual metaphysics, which is for him the real life, would live in the real world into that. So it was about the, the discussion that, that could have uh, started between two of you. I'm afraid, Fabrik, that this is going to remain a question in the air because um, we're going to have to say goodbye now. <laughs> but thank you very, very much for being with us and um, for sharing your thoughts at the end. So we're going to sign off now with, because the cinema is going to be used by the next event. But thanks very much. Thank you so much for participating in this Miss in Paris too. Okay. And, uh, Thank you for all your papers about that.